Assalamu alaikum khawateen hazrat. Welcome to the Virtual University of Pakistan. We are getting into lecture number 16 of Marketing for Nonprofits, MKT 6 to 8. The topic of learning is going to be the remaining part of the organizational level of brand raising, the part which falls within the realm of marketing people. You will recall that um, in the previous component, I talked about all those elements which fall within the domain of the top management, meaning vision, mission, values, objectives, and goals. And in this component, I'm going to talk about uh, things like audiences, the positioning, and personality, because these three are the ones which uh, are typically the marketing-centric uh, elements and jobs, and therefore have to be taken care of by the marketing people. First of all, audiences. No question about the fact that uh, we need to have a very precise understanding of for the audiences that we are dealing with. And we also know the fact that basically there are three classifications of audiences that uh, any nonprofit deals with. Okay, the first is the, the fundraising audience uh, consisting of individuals, groups, corporations, foundations, governmental, as well as international agencies. Then we have program audiences, uh, the, any audiences that uh, the, are uh, connected with the program. Either they execute to the program or they are at the receiving end and they are the subject of that particular program. It could be communities and we also call them clients. The third classification is uh, advocacy audiences. Here we have uh, the people like community leaders, the volunteers, activists, and all those people and sponsors uh, who uh, really advocate uh, the our cause, not only advocated, just advocated, rather advocated with the uniqueness that we have. Since all these uh, the audiences are uh, the very different in nature, they have uh, the different profiles, different personalities, and uh, the different character. It is for this particular fact that uh, the experts um, seem to believe that uh, they need to look into all these audiences in a more insightful way so that we really can draw lines between uh, different uh, the subsets of these audiences. So this basically takes us back to the segmentation exercise and uh, we have to take a very close look at that exercise, not from the point of view of uh, the, the motivations um, that, uh, that we made the basis of uh, the while we looked into segments as to uh, the, what really it is that motivates uh, the people to donate toward a certain cause. Now uh, what we can do is uh, that we can take a look at the same uh, research uh, design and results and uh, the come up with uh, the certain more findings uh, by taking a look at um, our results of psychographics put together with demographics and then come up with uh, those segments which we think are just about appropriate in terms of uh, reachability through different communication tools. Um, you know, there are uh, the segments who are more reachable uh, by uh, the internet uh, the kind of uh, supports, and then there are segments who are uh, the more uh, receptive to uh, traditional uh, the way of uh, the marketing things. But here, uh, what experts also profess is that uh, we develop different personas for different segments. So in other words, uh, one particular group of uh, the people, whether we are talking of donors or we are talking of uh, the other audiences, you know, program audiences or uh, advocacy audiences, uh, we have to draw lines in terms of you know, creating different segments. And those segments, uh, the ones created, have to be labeled in as uh, the precise a way as uh, they can uh, reflect 
the personality of okay, that particular segment or that particular sub-segment or that particular group. In other words, experts say that the broad terminology like donors is not good enough when it comes to dealing with different audiences with the help of different kinds of uh, the communications and um, the different tools that we have at our disposal. And I have given you the example because we have a mixed pack of uh, the IMC, the meaning integrated communication uh, the marketing campaign. And uh, depending on uh, what really triggers the, the mechanism at the receiving end, okay, we um, describe the persona of different segments. Now, if we again go back to the example of uh, uh, the marketing research program that we carried out in order to unravel the, the motivations behind donors could making donations, um, we also, like I said, can take a look at uh, the psychographic and demographic findings in terms of defining their personalities. Okay, for example, donors who um, are uh, very uh, regular um, and they are regular okay, because they are convinced uh, on the basis of certain evidence that our program is very effective and okay, we are a God-fearing company uh, and whatever we do, it uh, really improves the social welfare and takes care of okay, so many uh, the poor, downtrodden people and so on and so forth. We've got to give a certain personality trait or personality label, just like we describe one person as hardworking, as honest, full of integrity, and so on and so forth. Once we have labeled different groups with different personas, we can come up with the right communication campaigns. To elaborate further on that particular research design, and, and findings, uh, we also can um, uh, surmise uh, a very important point that uh, we can come up with the most appropriate communication campaigns in terms of our priorities or in terms of our changing priorities. For example, if there's a change of priorities in relation to our objectives, then we've got to see which communication campaign is uh, more appropriate in this particular situation, because we here are dealing with this particular audience, which happens to be a segment or a sub-segment of donors or of advocates or of um, program uh, executors. So the appropriateness of the communication campaign, depending on drawing these segmental lines, is the essence of taking an insightful look at the audiences. It is not just uh, the context of uh, the changing priorities, because we can take a look at uh, the appropriateness of communications in so many different ways. Uh, the, for example, again, going back to the segments that we uh, the drew up uh, in relation to the motivating factors, um, we can concentrate on uh, those segments that uh, happen to be uh, regular donors, uh, only because uh, we know the kind of uh, uh, the personality that this segment has. And don't forget that the personality of the overall segment can, has to be um, looked at as the personality of one uh, the particular person. Uh, I'm gonna throw some more light on the personality side of uh, the element, uh, but uh, here in terms of creating personas, we have to look at the appropriateness of which communication is going to be more suitable to which particular audience. So if it is a question of uh, shifting uh, motivations or rather strengthening uh, the motivations of uh, the donors from their being casual to their becoming a rather regular, uh, you know, we come, can come up with uh, a different communication campaign because there the objective is to strengthen the motivation. Uh, whereas uh, we may find ourselves in a situation uh, where uh, the people have started having negative uh, the motivations in the sense that uh, they now have started donating to some other cause. For example, uh, the people uh, who um, say they donate uh, on religious uh, basis, uh, they may start experiencing uh, the certain shifts in their behavior because somebody else has approached them and their motivation 
to start donating to another cause is still the same, meaning religious reasons. But they think that the other cause uh, is more pressing um, and therefore it warrants that their attention more uh, than uh, it does for your program or your cause. You are going to come up with a different communication campaign in that, that particular situation. Go back to the tools of communication at our disposal and uh, you will realize that personal spaces is uh, the one of the tools. And uh, we can have you know, the personal uh, the meetings with such donors, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, conversations. Uh, we can uh, get into small uh, seminars uh, where uh, by, uh, we can uh, reinforce the importance and the uniqueness, so to say, of uh, our program and uh, they may succeed in uh, convincing those people that they still have to continue donating toward our cause. So the point here is that uh, different communications are needed for uh, the different kinds of audiences. Audiences could have to be divided into different groups and subgroups uh, as long as uh, they uh, contain the uh, essence of uh, their being mutually exclusive and uh, their being uh, entities and groups that will give you differential responses. I mean, the divisions uh, have not to be carried out uh, just for the sake of it. Divisions uh, have to be carried out because you're looking for uh, differential uh, responsiveness. And uh, this differential responsiveness is the denominator on which uh, you base your decisions on the way you communicate, okay, meaning the appropriateness of uh, the communication uh, tools and then the communication campaign that you put together to reach different people who you think are going to come up with different responses. They will behave in a different way and therefore they've got to be reached in a different way. Another important uh, feature of uh, this uh, the particular element is that uh, the persona that you have given to the different groups has got to be looked into and studied on an ongoing basis because there could be changes in the personas depending on changes in the environment. And therefore, whenever a change takes place, you've got to bring about a corresponding change in your communication patterns. And the ongoing study with the help of small surveys, interviews, and okay, the focus groups okay, the could also be instituted. Um, it is not always that okay, you come up with a very comprehensive and complicated or sophisticated kind of a quantitative research design, okay, which should be the basis of your research. Okay, once you have carried that out, it should remain valid for quite some time to come. And okay, you can always supplement that okay, with the help of these okay, aids that you have at your disposal, okay, because we never lose sight of uh, the one particular reality of nonprofits uh, that they are always hard pressed for funding. And uh, it is the job of the marketing people to do more in less. This is the essence. With that, let's now move on to the next uh, element of um, this portion of the organizational level, and that is positioning. Here. I'm not going to talk about what positioning is. We all are kind of experts on what it really is. We know it is the point of differentiation and the essence is to go the home into the minds of our audiences with that simple uniqueness. We know all that. Here, we've got to take stock of the interpretation that goes into the communicative process. And we've got to see to it that we can develop the right links between our positioning and the vision and mission statements and also our personality. This is basically the job of the positioning which gets highlighted in terms of our communication campaigns. And the level is very important in the sense that it 
really lays the ground for the next level, which is about identity. So in other words, it is the point of differentiation and uh, the our positioning with which um, becomes the basis of uh, creating the visual identity and side by side the messaging platform. And uh, we know as part of the messaging uh, platform, uh, the vision statement and uh, the, the mission statement, or if we have just one statement, which is a combination of vision and mission, uh, is extremely significant and is very critical. And uh, the positioning uh, flows out of uh, the, the mission that we have uh, created uh, and established uh, for the organization. And therefore, uh, the positioning becomes the basis of uh, all that uh, which follows the, uh, the point of positioning, meaning uh, the basis of uh, the personality and then the basis of the identity level and, of course, the experiential level. Because it is a positioning which uh, makes um, its mark um, and uh, plays its vital role when we pick up the right tools of uh, communication and uh, uh, put them together as part of the integrated marketing uh, communications. Here, um, the one question that might pop up in your minds, what really is the difference between positioning and the mission? Well, it's a very sensitive kind of a question and the answer lies um, in uh, there being not really a great difference between the two. The only thing is that uh, the positioning is internally focused, whereas mission is externally focused. We talk about the same things as part of the positioning statement and we talk about the same things as part of the, the mission statement. However, there is a difference and that lies in the complexity and, and the details of the mission statement, which are not written as part of the statement per se, which are written as detailed messaging about which I'm going to talk later as the part of another um, level and as part of another element. But the point is that uh, positioning is something which uh, that we talk about in superlatives, like uh, that we say that this is the best program that anybody has seen on the nonprofit's side. I mean, I'm just giving one example. Or we might say that, uh, that we have the uh, highest the level of uh, um, qualitative expertise of the professionals who work for our organization. Now, these are the kind of statements which are extreme statements and they are laced with superlatives. This is not the kind of approach that we take when we talk of uh, the mission statement or when we talk of anything that we say in support of the mission because mission is externally um, oriented and it is externally focused. It is um, supposed to be read by anybody, meaning by all the audiences uh, who come into contact with uh, the organization. Again, it is not just the external audience or audiences, it also is the internal audience. You remember I talked about the fact that uh, in the absence of uh, formal expression of the, the mission statement, um, two or three different people from within the same organization may talk about the same mission in two or three different ways. And that's where the disaster may lie. And that is why um, this concept must not be oversimplified and everything has got to be detailed in writing with the help of whether your seniors and um, you know, uh, even outside sponsors. Uh, the, the audiences uh, that uh, happen to um, uh, help us uh, with uh, advocacy, with fundraising, and with provision of uh, all that human resource that we do not have at our disposal, and uh, they render that service uh, through uh, the staff members of their own organizations, uh, which uh, may either be on the, uh, the private side, uh, or which rather are uh, mostly on the, uh, the private side, the meaning uh, commercial enterprise, or any uh, part of the, uh, the agencies. It is the help which uh, people are more than willing to give wherever they can be supportive. So back to the point of uh, the positioning, it has to be very succinct, it has to be internally focused, 
and it has to lay the ground for uh, everything that follows the positioning, the meaning while describing the personality of the organization and while developing the visual identity uh, of the organization and while uh, expressing uh, all the elements of the messaging platform because everything has to revolve around this pivot. This is the key. Positioning also is the key against which we can assess our organization and against which we can assess whether we are following the right course or not. And you will recall that we can do that with the help of small surveys, focus groups, etc., etc., just to stay on course and to make sure that we are following ourselves by the nose and not really drifting, you know, right or left, um, just because somebody from within the organization uh, thinks that we've got to be a little adventurous and uh, we've got too monotonous and uh, we've got to experiment a few more things. The answer is no. Again, whatever you decide at any the point of the strategic process, meaning at any juncture which you can relate with one of the elements of the uh, brand raising a process, which basically is a, a translation of the strategic process, you've got to relate that particular juncture or situation with the element, the most appropriate element on that particular grid or on that particular spectrum. And then see where is the relationship and uh, what is it that uh, has gone wrong if something really has. Or if something has not gone wrong, just the whimsical thinking or um, advocating things which do not really have a strategic uh, solid basis is not and should not make sense to you in terms of making any changes. Okay, there's so much for the positioning side of uh, uh, the organizational the level of uh, the brand raising and don't lose uh, sight of the fact that uh, this is uh, the part of the marketing realm and with this, we move on to the next point or element, which is the personality. Any organization has a very distinct personality. And personality basically is a function of so many different attributes. An organization thinks it has so many different attributes. For example, it is very hardworking, it is very competent, it is matter of fact, it is the God-fearing and so on and so forth. But what is important about all these attributes in the context of personality is that uh, the, all these attributes have got to be perceived uh, by the audiences in the same way. So this again is a question of uh, perceptions. There is something which you think uh, exists and there is something uh, which uh, the audiences uh, do not seem to think uh, does exist. And therefore there has to be a total uh, coherence and rather, rather congruence of uh, the two factors, the meaning of what the reality is and what is being perceived by the audiences. There are so many different ways of finding out whether the personality of the organization which you are trying to create does match with the perceptions of your audiences or not. Um, you know, you can carry out research. And I don't really have to elaborate on that, the kind of research which you have to carry out just to make sure that the attributes which you think you are enriched with uh, also are the ones which are perceived the same way. But important point here is you create a personality which basically flows out of the vision of the, with the organization. The reason I talk about that is because this factor is kind of inherent. Just uh, try to look into any of the very well-known, established and respectable uh, non-profit institutions in this country like the Cancer Hospital in Lahore or the Urology Institute uh, in Karachi or the eye care center at uh, the hospital in Karachi and all over the country as a matter of fact, that you will realize all these uh, institutions have uh, different personalities. Now the personalities which they have or which they have developed have not been developed by an accident. They are not uh, the result of uh, the ad hocism. As a matter of fact, you see that that is the result of uh, a certain vision. Uh, the founders, whoever uh, the founded these uh, the organizations had a vision. 
And while uh, envisioning what they wanted and uh, while looking into the future, they certainly had certain personality traits in their minds of the organizations which they were just about to create or which they have created. And therefore, uh, the personality is something which flows uh, out of the vision and it, 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 it gets the developmental increments as the process goes from one stage to another, meaning with the flow of the strategic process. Let us take the example of the Cancer Hospital in Lahore, Shaukat Khanum, and uh, take a look at the attributes of uh, personality which uh, the people perceive. In other words, which are believed by the audiences uh, who come into contact with that hospital or even those people who do not really have anything to do with the hospital. And they all believe in uh, the hospital being a place which is honest, which is modest, which is methodical and systematic. It is state-of-the-art facility. It is competent. It is God-fearing. It is meritorious. So these are the kind of attributes which um, uh, are part of the list which uh, uh, characterizes uh, the hospital I'm talking about. And same goes for uh, institutions like SIUT, the Urology Institute in Karachi, and LRBT, the Eye Care uh, the Trust Hospital uh, in Karachi, or rather all over the country. The personality or the personalities that these institutions have have not been developed by accident. As a matter of fact, they must have been uh, the part of the vision of the founders. They wanted their organizations to be like that. And then you see they have worked hard through commitment and with a sense of purpose to bring the mission of the organization to life. How do you bring the mission to life? Well, by following all the um, steps of the strategic process or brand raising. You may not call that you know, brand raising within your organization. But the fact still remains that you do something very similar to the process and you do that in a formalized way uh, which uh, institutionalizes all the steps and all the links that um, present themselves in an integrative fashion and uh, they give us the results in terms of uh, the very consistent communications. And uh, we have these consistent communications uh, because uh, we have um, you know, the right positioning and uh, we have the right personality. The point that we need to ponder here is that different institutions have different personalities and uh, the personality also is a function of the purpose of the organization and that is how an organization uh, develops itself. So going by a hypothetical situation, let us take a look at uh, that nonprofit you are a part of that wants to operate in the area of human services. You are tasked with uh, developing the brand name, the tagline, and um, the, the personality of the organization, um, you will like to have a brand name which is uh, expressive of uh, the friendly attitude because you really want to be helpful to um, all the victims of uh, different sorts of accidents. You would like to come up with um, a color the palette which um, is expressive of passion and you, in all probability, would like to go for red color because that's the kind of service that you are providing and that, in most probability, seems to have the best match with uh, uh, the passion with which you have created the organization. And when it comes to uh, developing the tagline, about which I'm going to talk in a, in a short while, you would like to have a tagline which uh, is expressive of um, efficiency, and uh, which also may have life-saving overtones because you are trying to save uh, the victims of accidents. You have to uh, take them uh, to the hospital um, at, 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 at very quick speed and uh, you have to offer uh, paramedical services on the way and therefore efficiency is uh, the essence uh, of uh, the purpose uh, of your existence. And uh, since you work toward saving their lives, if the tagline also has those connotations, so much the better. Another hypothetical situation could be that of um, an organization that uh, is operating to conserve uh, certain environmental features. 
and okay, you again are okay, out to develop a brand name and um, its okay, the tagline and of course other features. The question here is okay, how do you do that? Well, when it comes to picking the brand name, it has to be the one which is expressive of uh, serenity, tranquility and peace. Uh, when it is a question of uh, picking the color palette, I think that we've, we've got to go for uh, uh, all shades of uh, blues and greens uh, that express nature's colors. And uh, the, when it is a question of picking the tagline, we have to go for a modern sounding kind of a tagline which carries a strong appeal for all those segments of population that are lovers of environment and prefer to have the very neat and clean surroundings. So with these the two hypothetical examples, I think it becomes clear that it is a function of the personality of the organization or the institution with which basically um, lays the ground or the, the tone and, and the mood of communications um, in order to uh, reach our uh, targets more effectively. One with a word of caution here, uh, just like I said in relation to a couple of other elements, uh, we've got to be cautious about attributes also, okay, the meaning attributes of personality. We've got to make sure from time to time that the attributes that we think are perceived by our audiences are the ones uh, that are still relevant uh, to our communications. Because uh, if something has gone wrong with uh, the culture of the organization or a change has taken place in terms of external environment that has a bearing on uh, our communication campaign or uh, the, our the personality in one way or the other, We've got to look into all those factors and bring about adjustments so that we stay relevant. Relevance and consistency are two words which are extremely important when it comes to putting together our communication campaigns. With this, our elements of the organizational level are complete and we now can say that it is not just the vision and mission which they should uh, be uh, publicized and propagandized by the uh, organization. It also is uh, a function of so many other the factors which are equally important. And it is the interplay of all these elements that uh, we complete the strategic process. And in other words, this strategic process for brand raising consists of uh, vision, mission, values, objectives, audiences, positioning, personality. Now, there are uh, the certain uh, sub-elements uh, which uh, I'll be talking um, in, the, in the following uh, components, uh, but these are the major ones that form the uh, constitution of um, the organizational level. And uh, you will agree with me uh, with no hesitation that uh, these are the elements that really drive the organization. They're responsible for deployment of different resources they're responsible for putting together different uh, programs, responsible for execution of those programs and involvement of all the human resources and financial resources. And therefore, they've got to be very consistent. They've got to be linked with each other in an integrative fashion. And uh, only by doing so, we are going to uh, make our communications very consistent. And uh, we are going to uh, keep subjectivity uh, out of uh, our communications and uh, we are going to keep them very objective. In other words, in very plain words, we're not going to uh, be influenced uh, by those stakeholders or uh, even people from within the organization who may like to bring about a whimsical change um, toward any element of um, the whole process uh, because uh, until it is uh, supported uh, by a change uh, in one of the elements, um, it does not really warrant uh, any implementation. And uh, you should not be influenced uh, by anyone who does not think in a strategic way. Now, this is not to say that uh, we as marketing people have to be rebellious, uh, which generally people think we are, but uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, we've got to be very systematic and uh, orderly 
and logical in terms of following all the steps so that we can keep our communications very effective, very consistent, very relevant to the point. And the test of our communications uh, for being uh, consistent and logical and so on and so forth uh, lies in answering some of the questions. The one is we take a look at our uh, communications um, in, a, um, in a very introspective way, the meaning that we carry out a self-examination uh, by uh, looking into uh, the factor of uh, the positioning and, and personality. Is it that our communications reflect the right positioning? Do they reflect the right personality? For which you see that we have learned you know, quite a bit so far. And uh, are our communications engaging? And to what extent they really are motivating different audiences to take the desired action? As long as we get answers in an affirmative to all the questions that I have talked about, and we are convinced that we have consistency of communications, our positioning, our personality are well represented, and vision and mission of the organization are also very well expressed, and there is no ambiguity about the interpretation of the mission of the organization. We should be well uh, content with the communication campaign that we have put together. Uh, with this, I now would like to say thanks and on to the next topic of learning. We're now getting into the next level of uh, brand raising, which is the identity level. This level has uh, the two sub-levels. The one is what we call visual identity and the other is the messaging platform. Visual identity consists of things like uh, logo, color, images, typography, etc. And images, of course, are inclusive of uh, pictures and any graphics which uh, we may think are relevant to the visual identity of the organization. The messaging platform consists of uh, things like uh, the name of the organization, uh, vision, meaning vision statement, uh, mission statement, values statement, um, and then uh, key messages. And then if you other elements which uh, I don't really want to bombard you with because uh, they sound uh, very strange kind of uh, terminologies. But um, what we have to keep in mind is that anything that we need to communicate in order to build our brand and communicate uh, through different materials, uh, may those be brochures or um, flyers or um, advertising campaigns, uh, we've got to have uh, the different communication supports and we've got to have all these things ready so that we very succinctly and clearly can communicate with the target audiences. Now, it is very interesting here that this is the level of brand raising, which basically is associated with the building of a brand. Because it is logos, it is colors, it is images, typography, and of course, expression of all the relevant statements which uh, are very supportive of uh, the brand building process. Here, uh, we've got to understand uh, what a logo is as part of the visual identity. Well, the logos uh, could be of different kinds, but before I start talking of different kinds, let me tell you here that logo by itself is uh, not as powerful as it is while it is supported by other elements. Uh, for example, along with the logo, we have uh, the name and we also need to have the tagline and uh, the certain other features, all creative features. So logo does play a very important role. It is something very powerful, but it uh, is not extremely effective just by itself. Until the time it becomes so popular, it becomes so highly visible and acknowledgeable that the whole world knows what this is all about then the, just the logo is going to do the trick for your organization. Here, we're talking about a situation in which we are still in the developmental phase so that we can understand the essence of all these concepts. Logos uh, could be, like I said, uh, of different kinds. The one is uh, just the 
abbreviation of uh, a name. And this abbreviation is not uh, supported by any other feature. Uh, it is just a few letters and that's the end of it. Uh, for example, um, if we say LRBT and uh, we do not really support that with uh, the tagline or with the full name, uh, we say that this is the logo. I'm not saying that it is the logo for that particular institution. All I'm saying is that uh, a logo could be just the abbreviation of a full name. And a logo could also contain some images, some um, photograph or some graphics or some icons. Um, and when that happens, logo becomes even more stronger because uh, the imagery and icons um, and photographs are things uh, which go across all literacy lines. And uh, especially when we are trying to reach audiences uh, who are not really highly educated, uh, we need to have logos uh, which are supported by uh, these features. And uh, therefore, um, the people on the creative side not all of them are sitting within the organization. And the fact is, in the context of a nonprofit, the most of the creative people are from outside. They are from advertising agencies or consultants who specialize in uh, uh, doing creative work for brands. I'm not saying brand building, but the creative work for uh, the brand building. And you can always hire those consultants to uh, carry out these jobs. And all the more reason that you need to have the very clear uh, the messaging platform, meaning a very clear uh, the positioning you know, for the organization and vision and mission statements and so on and so forth, so that uh, you can provide them with a brief that explains you know, the essence of the whole organization. So uh, the, while developing a logo, uh, which may sound like a very small thing or a small um, article uh, of, of a big element, you know, it still carries a lot of importance in terms of uh, what is it that we need to generate in terms of creativity, in terms of resources, and in terms of uh, the logical sense that we have to put together. A couple of words about uh, the logos that are uh, just abbreviations. Uh, well, experts seem to think, and there's a consensus on that, that uh, those logos are not really effective. As a matter of fact, you know, they are uh, not the ones who really can engage different audiences. You may be thinking at the moment and you know, a counter argument could maybe flashing into your minds because when you think of uh, LRBT or SIUT or the abbreviated name for Shokat Khanum, you, you might think to yourselves, you know, why is it that these abbreviations are so well known? Well, for the simple reason that took a lot of effort, a planned effort and um, investment in terms of time and money uh, that has gone into the whole the brand building uh, exercise. And it is over time that they have become very catchy. And that's the difficult side of the abbreviated names because you really have to work a lot before you start having your logo acknowledged as something immediately recognizable. And that is the downside of the abbreviations. However, once you have the logo supported by a full name, then it makes the better sense. And the reason the abbreviated names do not make a lot of sense to our audience is because experts, again, seem to think that those seem to be confined only to the understanding of those who created them. And those are not really meant to go across the internal and the organizational lines into the realm of all those audiences that you need to reach. Um, and, and that makes you know, those lines uh, kind of fuzzy. Uh, in order to uh, keep them very crystal clear and uh, in focus, you need to have names uh, which are expressive. And that's why uh, while giving you examples of uh, the two different personalities of two different uh, hypothetical institutions, I talked about uh, names expressing you know, particular purpose of uh, those organizations or institutions. And therefore, um, it is uh, more sensible, so to say, uh, to have a name uh, which, is, um, which is complete, or um, it could be just one word which is expressive of the purpose of the organization. 
In other words, we are looking into the, this exercise of logos from two different angles. The one is the logos that are just typography, the meaning just a name. It could be an abbreviated name or it could be a full name. And logos, which also carry some images and photographs or some artwork, some creative artwork. The essence of a logo, whatever the form is, the meaning just typography or with icons, lies in answering a couple of questions. And uh, the question is, does the logo really reflect our positioning? It's the same question that you have to ask in terms of positioning, in terms of uh, your personality, and so on and so forth. Does the logo reflect our personality? If it does, why? If it does not, why? In both the situations, you've got to be very insightful because uh, this kind of information is going to reinforce your confidence if you are on the right lines and it is going to allow you to take some corrective action if you think you need to revise your logo. And you also need to answer the question whether the logo is engaging. Does it motivate the different audiences? Does it integrate those audiences? And last but not the least, is the logo expressive of the vision statement and the mission statement? If the answer to all these questions are in affirmative, then you are on the right lines in terms of putting together your communication campaign, or in other words, in terms of creating your logo. Whatever logo it is, it has been created based on certain strategic considerations, and it answers uh, your questions in terms of other important elements which have to be uh, considered and not lost sight of when you do this creative work. Let us now move on to the next element, which is about typography. Typography basically is a matter of uh, the style and uh, the type of print. It basically is a function of font and size, and uh, we all are accustomed uh, to those um, elements. Typography has a lot of communicative power when it is a question of reaching our target audience. The different uh, kinds of uh, typographies uh, have uh, the different levels of uh, characteristics in terms of their communicative power. Why? Because different typographies represent uh, different uh, the personalities or different dimensions of personalities of uh, the different organizations. With the help of typography, you can express uh, the modernism, you can express traditionalism, and uh, you can express something which is formal, and you can express something which is informal. Now, let me give you one example here. A flowing kind of a typography will be more suitable to the environment conservation cause, the one I talked about, than a human service. For human service, you are going to need to have um, a typeface which is very serious. It may be very bold and it may have colors which arouse uh, passion like I indicated earlier. But the fact is, the bold typeface and um, its seriousness uh, convey the one thing while the flowing typeface on typography uh, express something entirely different. And that is why we uh, seem to think as marketing professionals that we've got to standardize the typography of our programs. Experts could go on to say that all communications could within the organization, meaning the internal communications and also external communications have got to have the same typography. So much so that uh, the, you know, standardized kind of templates for those communications which happen on a daily basis are uploaded on websites of different organizations, of which you may be familiar. And you download say, one of the templates because the organization doesn't really want you to make any mistakes when it comes to using the right font, the right size, and the right justification on the right and left side, so on and so forth. The trick here is, or rather the problem here is, uh, trying to standardize the typography when you upload your content on the website. When you are dealing with websites and blogs and you are sending email blasts, you know, you cannot really maintain that kind of consistency of typography. And you've got to find yourself in a situation of trade-off, meaning if you try to standardize things, you may not get the results at the receiving end because when they download the content, it is a question of what is the font and size 
that happens to be the default of that particular computer. And it is because of that reason that uh, people like to go for um, picture images, like in JPEG, for example, of uh, the, the matter or the, wish or the content with which they get the portal in the cyberspace. But like I said, there's a trade-off. It becomes slow in terms of uh, downloads. So the organizations can have another alternative, and that is they like to go for the picture form of just about the logos and taglines, and the remaining content can be uploaded in the form of uh, a standardized kind of uh, a, um, a font, uh, which is uh, the, the um, routine standard uh, among so many different audiences all over the world. Uh, for example, Arial or Times Roman. So uh, you have to uh, be very uh, selective here. Um, I would like to go back to the trade-off. If you like to maintain the consistency uh, on the net also, then you lose in terms of, in terms of the time uh, pertaining to downloads. If you bring about a change uh, in terms of making uh, the download more efficient, then you've got to change the font and you've got to keep it as close to your standards as could be. And I think, you know, with this, you are fully in the picture as to what it is that I'm trying to communicate. Standardization of the typography is something to which organizations really pay a very heavy weight to. People should get accustomed to something which is extremely consistent in terms of not just the expression, I mean, not only the expression of the intent, meaning the strategic intent, they should also get consistent images at every point of exposure, at every point of interaction, so that they develop and form very consistent images in their minds. And it is that consistency with which make uh, which makes our uh, communications effective. Let us now move on to uh, the remaining uh, the two uh, elements. And I would like to be, be very brief on these two. The one is the color and uh, the other one is uh, the photographs and imagery. Well, it goes without saying that uh, the color palette has got to be the most appropriate. And what you have to keep in mind is that basically there are two color palettes every organization, in particular nonprofits, use. The one is the primary color palette, which is uh, just about you know the two colors. Generally, it is two. And the secondary color palette is the one which uh, consists of rather neutral colors, which can be added to websites as well and uh, which uh, have the um, uh, power and uh, the ability to keep things rather consistent. In terms of uh, the photographs and imagery, I think it is very clear to all of us by now, when we use uh, these uh, the elements along with uh, our logos and uh, the taglines and uh, the brand names, so to say, that we really inject a lot more communicative power into the content because uh, pictures uh, speak volumes and that's what you know what I'm talking about and with this we are done with the visual identity of um, the identity level of brand tracing.